La da 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 Recalling thrills of our love. Yeah. Hmm. Welcome, dear listeners, to Vermont Stretch Radio, broadcast to you live from the back end of Megacity Gimmel, broadcast to you from the sleepy mountain town of Killington Gimmel. Well, well, listeners, we have some exciting and wonderful news today. We are potentially, potentially, fingers crossed, at war at the moment. Just rumors, just rumors for now. But if the terrorist attacks across the megacity are in fact coming from Earth Cheat, we could see the first signs of an interdimensional war. And as much as I have been espousing that I am not excited for it, I am very much excited for the prospect of being able to uh, defend ourselves. Sort of a colonial thing. Uh, Break in the new world. A reminder, a reminder that this world has seen no war yet. It has been at a tentative peace for the entirety of its existence by uh, Earth, Bait, and associated alternate dimension inhabitants. Uh, we aren't certain if the cavemen that inhabited here previously had been at war, but uh, we can assume that they weren't. It's not so much of a thing that a primitive society would do, at least uh, a society more primitive than Brockton Bay. Well, well then, we are going to be starting with the story still making the rounds today, and that is that the Fallen won. They actually won. It doesn't matter that two out of the three families that got their leaders caught, uh, interesting tidbit actually, but the Fallen are up to four families now, with a fourth styling themselves after the Endbringer that joined after they became famous. Uh, where was I? Yes. So, we are looking back over the Fallen, as of course the Fallen remain a thorn in the side of Earthbait's politics for some time, and of course the fact that they tore open the portals that stretch into the sky, and are still visible from the entire city. It's a work of art what they've done to our skyline, and it has been a while since the Fallen attacked the portals of Earthbait, and we've not heard as much about them in a while, what with the mess of terrorist attacks from a random and unknown alternate dimension, cough, cough, Earth cheat. Well, I don't actually have that much in the way of new news on the Fallen, so I thought I'd dig up some of the old dirt on them, just so I don't have to repeat myself, and just so that I can, in fact, inform you of a few of their more famous deeds across history. So going back a fair, fair few years now, we have the death of Pete and Finn, possibly the worst hit to the Case 53 community, barring, of course, the Brockton Bay Brawl of 2011. Pete and Finn were two Case 53s that looked like monsters but didn't act like monsters, and so weren't treated by other people as if they were monsters. Mostly, of course, because they were cute. I'm sure if they had the pointed fangs and scabrous cuts of Nyx, nobody would have been drawing art of them. Uh, sorry to clarify there, that's Nyx, the founding member of the Slaughterhouse Nine. Not Nyx, the Las Vegas protectorate cape that retired shortly before they could be investigated for corruption. Now this is where someone else might say no relation, to clarify, of course, that there was no connection between Nyx and Nyx. I, I said it would be, I'm not going to clarify that there is no connection between Nyx and Nyx. So that's Nyx, the founding member of the Slaughterhouse Nine, who gave off a poisonous gas that caused brain damage, and Nyx, the Las Vegas Protectorate Cape, that gave off a poisonous gas that caused brain damage. Nyx, the founding member of the Slaughterhouse Nine, that could shape that gas into illusions that could be physically interacted with, and Nyx, the Las Vegas Protectorate Cape, that could shape her smoke into illusions that could be interacted with. Anyway, Pete and Finn, they, they, they had a lot of fan art drawn of them. They were 
popular celebrities among the online communities at the time, something that I have no experience or understanding of having been dead for most of that period of human history. I just sort of skipped out the early tens. Yes, but uh, anyway, they had been going down one of the sort of back road areas, they got in a bit of a bad mess, and a few bikers working for the Fallen uh, managed to find them, and then forcibly remove their horns and attach them to a rather impressive looking helmet. You can dig up a few of the pictures of it online, and really, it looks like something I'd want to wear. I, I have to be honest here, that thing is rather impressive. Uh, sadly, though, they died. It seems that some Case 53s die when they lose their horns. It seems silly to me, but it might be important for you to know just in case you ever face down a charging Case 53. Something of a tragedy to the Case 53 community, of course, because while people were fans of Pete and Finn, their death went uh, rather underreported amongst the media, and the Fallen all but got away with it, which goes to show, really, what one's willing to tolerate these days. More recently, in terms of Fallen news, the humiliating defeat of Valifor, son of one of the proudest and most important family leaders in the Fallen. They had made an attempt to make it in the highly competitive cape scene of Brockton Bay, where people aren't really considered a real cape until they've survived the Slaughterhouse Nine at least twice. Yes, the defeat of val e -Four, Vale for he'd had his eyes eaten by maggots under the command of the bug bitch of Brockton Bay, not to be confused with the bitch bitch of Brockton Bay. Now, apologies for the language, dear listeners, but you, if you are the sort of person that can hear me describe the death of two mutant children, or a man having his eyes eaten by insects, but you can't handle a little bit of bad language, then I am concerned for you, listeners. I am very concerned. What sort of person are you that you're willing to tolerate violence and madness, but not the slightly rude word? Anyway, maggots. They were allowed to dig behind the eyes of Velifor and then eat the important bits until he couldn't see no more. Any more? Until he was blind. Amusingly though, according to recent accounts from the Assault on the Fallen compound that should have remained confidential, but uh, well, if somebody's able to get their hands on them, they were Hardly confidential or protected information, were they? Or at least not very well protected information. The loss of his eyes has apparently seen his power shift from hypnotic vision to a hypnotic voice. Again, good for any of you in the audience to know, because just because you cut out the bits that should let someone use their power doesn't mean you've disarmed them. Uh, you'll most likely have to kill them and or continue removing bodily parts until they have nothing else to use for their power. Which is funny enough, as uh, according to an injury report, Valifor's lost his jaw. <laughs> uh, it's bloody hilarious, actually, thinking about it. Uh, what's he going to do now? Just sort of point himself in the direction of the people he wants to control? Gesture at them in sign language? Well, that about does it, really, for The Fallen, aside from, of course, uh, some of the rather interesting reports to come out of the arrestees of The Fallen Compound Assault. Uh, apparently, they claim to have been under a master power, so um, they're saying that uh, extraneous circumstances like control over them excuse the murders that they participated in. See, see that that's a funny story, because um, normally when people are under control of a master power, the PRT's response is to quarantine them and leave them there for two years to the rest of eternity, like a Semiric victim, or to have them executed on the spot. Hmm much like Alexandra and several other people I can think of off the top of my head. Hmm. Well, I suppose that uh, not having a choice is somehow a defence now? I'll, I'll leave those of you at home to think of that. Yes. Back, of course, on to today's topic, though, the, the war. Yes, sir. Uh, or rather the way that we are being attacked. Uh, why exactly do you think, you at home, 
that we would be attacked. What do we have that is worth taking? We have no industry of any note or of any value. Our technology boom is mostly led by tinkers and other sorts whose technology is completely incapable of replication by ordinary human hands. So, really, what are they planning for with terrorist attacks destabilizing any and all of our fragile system of amenities? The portal network. It's the portals. And it's rather silly when one has to sit down and think about it, considering we could just have given them portals or allowed them to form portals of their own. No, we have a network of portals used to prop up our town, and we are surprised when others come in with violence and murder, attempting to seize it for ourselves. Uh, one could say, almost, that Earth Gimmel is Brockton Bay wrought on a larger scale. Which sounds very depressing when one thinks about it, considering all of the nonsense that Brockton Bay has, the general lack of intelligence of its inhabitants, and their rather violent, violent tendencies, looking back over almost every Cape conflict there in recent history, and the brutal dictatorship that the undersiders have led over that town. Well... Well, well, well. Until the Coalition of Heroes, as we will all henceforth refer, refer to them now, the Not the Wardens, decide to actually tell us the reasons for the war that we are in. Until they actually decide to tell us what's going on, what capes are out there, and whether or not uh, they have in fact recruited a crazed Welsh supervillain to lead the Wardens frightfully absent from news in recent months, I should think. Until they decide to tell us what's going on, I recommend publicly insulting them and their legacy until they give in and tell you something. Mention their dead comrades. That usually helps. Eidolon, Mirrodin, Strider, Weaver. Now, uh, I, I seem to be a little bit more free-flowing today, and a little bit odd, and you, that that may be a cause of wor for worry for you. But uh, you see, I've I've been thinking about what I'll actually do if I ever get arrested for talking my mind, and and the answer is, I'll get to meet my old friends. I'll get to be the old me again. I'll get an excuse to break any of the little rules I've set for myself. This is Theodore Guy signing off and telling you that. You should never go quietly into the night, dear listeners. You should go loudly into the day, banging pots and pans and laughing at the Emperor's lack of pants and laughing at how stupid the Emperor looks when they decide to put on a shirt to cover it up. I don't know. Did, did that metaphor get away from... I, I think it works. I think it works, dear listeners. So, I'm signing off. Good night. Good night. Good night, listeners. Good night. Ba la da 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 da. This was a community project for the Parahuman Audio Community Content section, with the goal, of course, of uh, producing a little snippet of what the news might look at, like in the world of Ward, a web serial by J. C. McRae. Of course. The characters, events, settings, and, well, a few other things besides, of Worm, Ward, and the Parahuman series as a whole are, of course, owned by J.C. McRae. I heavily recommend that you check out the Worm and Ward audiobook projects, fan, non-profit community projects created by Rain Ramsey, a rather interesting project and a rather decent chap who is quite content to host uh, our little radio show on his website. So, thank you very much for listening, dear listeners.